name is uh, Ramana, I'm V. Ramana. I'm the uh, Woodrow Wilson School with the Program on Science and Global Security and the Nuclear Futures Laboratory. Uh, this uh, semester I'm leading a policy workshop on rural energy alternatives in India, uh, for which I had invited our speaker today, Asim Srivastava, uh, as a guest lecturer. And uh, Asim was generous enough to offer to also do a seminar here, so I think so that maybe other, others can also sort of benefit from this uh, experience and this, what he has to say. Uh, Asim is, uh, comes from an economics background. Uh, he told me that uh, uh, he, he got his PhD from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and he chose that over Yale, and so I think Princeton should be happy about that. <laughs> but uh, his um, uh, PhD thesis there focused really on um, uh, forest community management of forests in uh, the Himalayas, not quite what economists typically do. Uh, and uh, you know, it's one of those theses with no equations in them. And so even his, even his mother could read it and understand it. And his latest book um, called Churning the Earth, I unfortunately forgot about my copy. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> his only book, I think, uh, which is written with uh, Ashish Kothari, uh, has been uh, widely acclaimed for dealing with a whole range of very complex issues uh, with remarkable simplicity and something which he can reach out to a large number of people. And I'm sure that you'll see him, his talk demonstrate the same characteristic here too. Thanks for coming. What I would like to do is to begin by telling you a short story, um, which will give you a sense of uh, how I see the issues which I'll be talking about. Uh, everybody knows that uh, money makes the world go round and so on. Uh, but I had my best sort of introduction to the idea from an expert uh, last year at a conference in South Korea. And the gentleman, uh, this was at a, the World Conservation Congress. And you won't believe it, but the largest sort of fraction of people there were actually from high finance. And uh, the person who uh, I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm about to tell you about, he's actually a hedge fund manager. Uh, now, a hedge fund manager, as, as most of you know, is somebody quite remote from environmental concerns per se. So I asked him uh, what a hedge fund manager was doing at an environmental conference. And he said, well, you know, I'm a nature lover. I have you know, always loved plants and animals and so on. And in my day job, I realized I was doing criminal things. And so I needed to do something to address my real passions and my concerns. So he proceeded to tell me a story, and this is what he said. He said about 15 years back, he was having a, a, a meal at a restaurant in Boston uh, with some three friends. And while they were ordering food, he realized one of them got Norwegian salmon, somebody got Argentinian beef, somebody else got food from another continent, Nobody was ordering good old New England clam chowder or some such boring stuff. So he said that's when the first penny dropped, which is we were all eating jet lagged food. These are his words. Uh, all this food has traveled 5,000 or 10,000 miles and has been stored and irradiated and treated in all sorts of ways before arriving at the restaurant table. So that was his first observation. When the time came to pay the bill, uh, he realized that all the conversation that evening had been about debt, about how many millions each one owed. But when they actually paid the bill, it was with credit cards. So he said that's when the second penny dropped, which is how do people with so much debt have any credit? And then he says a third penny dropped, which was he put two graphs together in his mind. So if you can visualize it, uh, in the top right-hand corner, he drew an exponentially rising curve between time on the horizontal axis and the expansion of money since the early 1970s on the vertical axis, right? And in the bottom quadrant, he drew a graph between the same time period and the extinction of species since the early 1970s. And that's an exponentially declining graph, the mirror image of the top graph. Uh, 
Now, the moment he put that, those two images together, uh, something clicked in my mind as to what might be going on at the cutting edge of the two ends of the world, so to speak. Uh, here's something very abstract, which is the expansion of money since the early 70s. And on the other hand is something utterly concrete and not even man-made. But the implications for that utterly concrete nature are actually quite severe. Is there a connection? So here's my sort of very rough cut sort of analysis of this. Uh, it, it requires a lot more research and a lot more reflection than I've had time for, and many more uh, qualified people need to think about it. It is this. If you look at the expansion of money, which is different, very different from the expansion of income and wealth, right? Money is supposed to be a symbol, right, of, of income and wealth. Now, most of the money that we carry in our uh, wallets, and that includes even credit cards, is actually a very small fraction of the total amount of money in existence. And if you think about it, you will reach the conclusion that actually most of the money in use today is virtually a numerical adjustment in abstract cyberspace, and that's all. And the moment a ban bank makes a loan, it creates money. All economics undergraduates you know, understand that. But at the same time, a debt is created. Now, what is a debt? A debt is a claim, above all. Now, imagine that you keep multiplying these claims virtually endlessly, and the actual amount of income and wealth is not growing anywhere near the rate at which abstract money is growing. So which means that the claims on all income and wealth are constantly expanding, but there's lots more symbols and abstract things left over by way of claims over non-man-made things, if you know what I mean. And that explained the presence of so many finance people at this conservation conference last year. So what you're really looking at is a world in which you know, expanding claims on real wealth and income, you know, uh, have actually overstretched themselves beyond the scope of the man-made economy and are now pushing against the boundaries of, shall we say, the God-made economy. That is to say, nature itself, right? So, and when you saw some of the topics at this conference last year, uh, they were basically, not all of them, but many of them, were about defining markets on different aspects of the natural world. Uh, not only, you know, the coastlines and the beaches and so on, but what's lying under the oceans, the coral reefs, and you define futures markets in all these resources and so on. So in other words, what is called greening the economy very often nowadays refers to creating markets in the financial stratosphere, so to speak. And hence my sort of personal obsession with trying to link uh, the two extremes, finance on the one side and ecology on the other side. To look not just at why you know, conservation is interested, uh, finance is interested in conservation, but to actually try to see the implications for nature of the financialization of the economy. So my sort of hypothesis to you right now is that the financialization of the economy has actually accelerated the commodification of nature and the monetization of nature and precipitating environmental problems in all parts of the world now at pretty rapid speed. Now the kind of numbers we are talking about are huge. I mean, if you just look at the ratio of the amount of money that changes hands every day to the actual value of goods and services which changes hands every day across national boundaries. That ratio is somewhere between 20 to 40 is to 1. So for every dollar of goods and services actually bought uh, between countries, there's 20 to 40 dollars being transacted in the imaginary or not so imaginary realm of finance. Now, why am I telling you this at the outset of a talk which is supposed to be on Indian globalization and its impact is because the time that India integrates with the global economy, which is 
in the late 1980s and the early 1990s is a time when the West and the world economy is moving more and more in the direction of financialization. The financialization actually dates from, actually you can date it very precisely, August 15, 1971, when the dollar is delinked from gold and exchange rate system, the fixed exchange rate system which prevailed before that breaks down and you have fluctuating values for currencies which make speculation possible and the moment speculators and investors smell that blood, then of course they gradually work towards the unraveling of a whole panoply of financial legislation since the 1930s. So what you get in 2008 with the crash in, in the US is actually something which can be traced quite systematically to the sort of changes which were inaugurated by the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system in 1971. Uh, it's a classic example of how a crisis is actually turned into an opportunity. Uh, it's a very good study in that. So, uh, so India comes into this whole game in the late 1980s and the early 90s when we are supposed to have you know, an open economy. Now, an open economy means openness not just to trade but also importantly to physical investment as well as most importantly finance, which is why the rush and powerful rhetoric in our media in India today about how the reforms are actually not complete. We need to reform more. So what is it that remains? Well, many things remain, but the most important thing that remains and which has so far, I argue, actually saved India the real blushes is the opening up of what is called the capital account which is to say you can bring in large volumes of hard currency and take them out, take it out at will uh, and that's called the, uh, the liberalization of the capital account. Now a country like China for instance has not contemplated that possibility. Uh, I spoke to a Chinese economist last month in Delhi and he was very clear that we will follow uh, the West and the US on everything, but on our currency, we are not gonna make any compromises. We are not gonna let speculators play with our currency. So India is moving on another track, and uh, it's actually trying to liberalize more and more uh, in the direction of opening up the capital account, which will actually destabilize the, 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 the rupee and with that the economy uh, much, potentially much more. For some time the news might be good as long as the money comes in, but when, when the money leaves, it leaves uh, with a lot of uh, stains on the floor, so to speak. So, uh, so this is basically uh, the sort of broader context in which globalization happens in India, in which uh, you know, reforms are enacted after the early 90s. What we, uh, do in our book is to look at two broad areas of impact. One is the socio-economic impact of globalization and the other is the ecological impact. Uh, the growth rates, if you, if you just look at the reported official growth rates, they're very impressive. And India has clearly made the transition from what used to be called the Hindu rate of growth of three, three and a half percent per annum to an annual growth rate of GDP of in the region of between six and nine percent per annum, especially since 2003. Uh, and you would expect that this much growth would actually make severe dents in poverty as it has in many other contexts like South Korea and China. Uh, and you would expect that hunger and malnutrition would be, you know, if, while not being finished, would come to be seen as things of the past in the foreseeable future. Is it the case? That's the first question that we sort of ask in this book. And what we find is that uh, looked at in a very hard-nosed, hard-headed way, uh, not only is it not the case, actually things might be getting worse for a very large number of our people. Uh, so take for instance just one simple index which is availability of food. Now if you look at the per capita calorie intake okay, across the country 
In most parts of India since the early 90s, per capita intake of calories has either remained constant or in some parts of the country it has actually gone down. Uh, which is a pretty remarkable thing for a country growing at that, at that pace. So you put this data to the planners and, 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 and sort of the, the, the advocates of this form of growth and globalization and what do they say? They make the argument that 60% uh, of India is still employed in agriculture and most of these people are now working less and less with their hands. They have more access to machinery. So they actually have to expend less labor in order to you know, secure their necessities. And so they eat less. So we decided to do a sort of back of the envelope check on it and we went to the FAO data set on whether there is even one example in history of any country which has been growing into prosperity <coughs> and has actually suffered either stagnation or decline in calorie intake and there isn't one. Not one country. So clearly India has bucked the trend and for reasons best understood by the planners. So that is one very powerful set of numbers and I'm, 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 the numbers are reported in the book and uh, they're both mostly from, in fact entirely from the National Sample Survey which is conducted by the Central Statistical Organization of the Government of India. Uh, so, there's, so we argue that there's actually a reason why the Indian governments of the last 20 years have not been reporting very much uh, or, or not talking very much in their planning documents and press releases and so on about actual food intake. Uh, and trying to measure poverty in purely monetary terms, uh, which means that the numbers are compromised in profound respects. Uh, we, if we had time, I would go into some of this, but uh, leave that aside right now. The the, another set of numbers which corroborates this data is the per capita availability of food. And what you find there is that again compared to the early 90s, the per capita availability of both cereals and pulses has actually either stagnated or declined. In the case of pulses it has declined quite dramatically actually uh, over these 20 years. Uh, which means overall production is still rising, but not keeping up with population growth, uh, something which is to be contrasted with the Chinese experience. And the answer to that riddle is that Chinese investments in agriculture, especially state investment in irrigation, has been rising, has been quite significant throughout. And in India, state investment in irrigation has been constantly declining. You have uh, roughly about half if not more of our agriculture still rain fed, right? Uh, so uh, there's, there's a bunch of other data we look at and that has to do with employment because if the belief is that growth is going to lead to the famed trickle down effect, what are the mechanisms through which it works? Well essentially two mechanisms, one is the generation of employment and the other is if the state collects high enough uh, tax revenues, then some of those tax revenues can be disbursed towards uh, you know, uh, social spending, redistributive activities, etc. Has it been happening? And here there's only one statistic which is enough to actually nail the point. Uh, if you look at the organized sector of the Indian economy, which is to say uh, these are production units which employ at least 10 people, utilize electricity, pay income taxes and so on. Uh, the modern economy. Uh, the number of jobs in the modern sector since 1991. In 1991 there's 26.7 million people employed in the organized sector. And by the time you come to 2012, almost a generation down, you have 29 million people. Okay, so the net accretion of jobs is 2.3 million. Of these 29 million, about 18 million are employed in the public sector, so government employees. So the sum total of jobs in the private organized sector, in other words, the most vocal sector in today's India, uh, the sum total of jobs created in that sector, in the organized sector, is 11 million. 
not created, the number of jobs held. The number of jobs created on the net is somewhere between three and four million over a period of 21 years. During the same period, the increase in the workforce is roughly of the order of 120 to 150 million, depending upon how you estimate the size of the working population. So not even 2% of the increase in the workforce is actually being absorbed by the organized economy. Now the criticism of this argument that is given is that actually most jobs that have been created are in the unorganized sector, the informal economy, which is right. Now two questions need to be asked. One is the extent to which those jobs have been created or are those default jobs, which is to say, are they jobs which displaced farmers from the countryside have taken up in the manner of, uh, let's say, um, you know, a small buying of a small push cart on which to sell vegetables or something? Or are they jobs actively created because of the government policies? You know, so because of the government's policies or despite the government's policies, you have to ask that question. And secondly, how many such jobs have been created? Now here I'll just give you one piece of data. If you look at the IT sector, information technology, which has been the famed cutting edge of India's growth in the last 20 years, the total number of organized sector jobs in that sector is 2.8 million. And the total number of jobs, including the unorganized sector jobs, is about 9 million. So roughly a ratio of 3 is to 4. Even if 10 jobs were being created in the unorganized sector for every job created in the organized economy, you would still have a grave problem. So even if 23 million jobs had been created in these 20 years, instead of 2.3 million, you would still have a major employment, unemployment <coughs> problem. Uh, the, the other argument which is given is that, you know, because of the high tax revenues, this is the sort of argument proposed by, say, somebody like Amartya Sen, uh, the high tax revenues which are collected because of high growth, that those can be channelized to, you know, state programs to create jobs through employment guarantee programs, which is being done to a degree, or to, you know, redistribute income in some other way, invest in education and health and so on. Uh, there is partial truth in that if you just look at, look at it in terms of the number of jobs created. But the scale of the problem is immensely greater than what is actually being done or can be done uh, with this sort of a growth strategy. Uh, so basically we argue that trickle down as it is intended to happen is not happening. And this should be no surprise because if you look at global data, uh, this is data from the World Bank and being used by the New Economics Foundation in London, they show something very interesting. What they do is a 20 year exercise from 1981 to 2001 and they ask the question of the total growth of income in the world economy, what fraction was actually, uh, you know, uh, taken by the bottom 40% of the world. So roughly people less than $2 a day in the World Bank's estimates of poverty. And the answer is between 1981 and 2001, out of $45 of growth generated in the world economy, $1 went to the bottom 40%. So then the next thing they do is compress that period to 1991 to 2001, the Wall Street years, and try to see what happens to trickle down in those 10 years. And what they find is out of $166 of growth in the world economy, $1 ends up with the bottom 40%. So the inference one may draw is that it costs more and more by way of, shall we say, bribing the rich in order to remove poverty by exactly the same amount. Yeah. So if that's the global picture and India is integrating with the global economy in these years, it's not much surprise if India has not been able to achieve trickle down. Countries which have achieved trickle down, places like South Korea or to a lesser degree China, achieved it in other ways. Uh, South Korea, for instance, had massive land reforms, uh, redistributed land on a big scale in rural areas and was industrializing at a very different time in history. I mean, in the 1960s and 70s, 
when actually technology was a lot less labor displacing than it is today. So with present models of industrialization, or rather the updated models of industrialization, it becomes very hard to actually create jobs on the scale that a country like India needs. Uh, we also looked at micro level data and I actually visited some uh, industrial plants around the country to see what has been the experience with hiring people over the last 20 years. And the data pretty much corroborates the aggregate data I gave you. Uh, just to give you one example, in a place like Jamshedpur, which has the largest steel plant in India and the first one, uh, they produce five times as much steel uh, compared to 20 years ago today and they use half the workers they were using then. So the productivity per worker is 10 times higher because of mechanization. And the same story prevails in automobiles, in computer, in a whole set of areas which we, we looked at. So uh, the, hence our skepticism about the present growth and industrialization strategy actually being able to tackle poverty and unemployment uh, in significant ways. The, the overall increase in output, in industrial output for instance, the increase in these 20 years is of the order of about three and a half to four times. And that increased output is being shared by roughly the same number of people who were sharing it then. So hence the rise in inequalities. And which leads me to make the connection with the point I started with, which is when you have starkly rising inequalities, now, any economist or macroeconomist will tell you, at some point, you might run into a major problem of demand, which is you have the technical capacity to actually set up industries and so on, but as China is realizing now, you don't have the market to actually sell the output to. Now, Henry Ford's point, you know, that if you don't pay your workers enough, who's going to buy your cars, that comes into play. So good economics and good ethics melds in, meld into each other somewhere. Uh, but if you have dramatically rising inequalities as you have in India today and you have in the United States, what do you do? In order to tackle the demand problem, what do you do? Well, if the US is the model to follow, what you do is you actually create debt. You know? If real wages, as they have remained constant in the US since the early, in the sense, late 1970s, if real wages do not rise and your economy is capable of producing a lot more, one thing you can do is sell debt to your workers and with that debt they buy uh, whatever excess, you know, the system is generating, right? And which is what also leads to the 2008 crash in some significant respect. Now, that's in fact the model being followed around the world. If you look at what is happening with Europe, Europe and its debates about austerity, where are they coming from? They're coming from the fact that Germany is overproducing and is, you know, selling loans to the southern countries in Europe in order to buy excess German output. Uh, the same is now happening between US and China. I mean, China, you know, overproduces and, and US prints the dollars or, you know, creates the dollars and buys those goods. So the debt bubble model of growth is, is pretty much the default setting of today's world economy. And there's much talk in India right now about how corporates, which is to say corporations who are engaged in production, should actually get into banking and should actually uh, uh, you know, start making loans. There was a famous resignation from the board of the Reserve Bank of India recently. Uh, one of the big uh, private industrialists resigned from the board because there was going to be a conflict of interest given the fact that his business group was going to start uh, a, a, a banking you know, uh, outlet. So you have these situations which are actually very similar at very different levels of incomes and standards of living, but the model of growth in which you do not want to ask questions about distribution of income and wealth in that model of growth, your main exit option is to create debt and to get more and more people saddled with debt, expose the whole system to far greater systemic risk as it's known to finance people, as well as you know, compound the inequalities while claiming sometimes pretending to solve those inequalities by actually making loans to the poor.
right? Loans which you know in advance are not coming back, right? So that's the nature of the system as it is working today. Uh, so one may read the whole financialization of the economy as a symptom uh, rather than a solution to the underlying crisis of demand and the redundancy of labor being created by a hyper-tech industrial model. The other side of the picture when it comes to the impact of globalization in India, which we look at in the book, is to closely examine the ecological impact. And there the picture is actually far more startling than even in the case of socioeconomic consequences. So I'll just cite you a few numbers to give you a clue as to how much uh, you know, damage is happening. Um, there's actually a World Bank study which was released this July, uh, which showed that if you just take account of two kinds of environmental damage, that is to say, they look at uh, damage to human health on account of air and water pollution and damage to the soil, uh, loss of soil productivity and health on account of use of chemicals and salinization and so on. Just these two things when you could actually look at about 20 other important things uh, when it comes to you know, indices of damage. Just looking at these two things led them to the result that something like 5.7% of India's annual production, GDP, is being lost. So which virtually nullifies present growth rates in India. The data is corroborated by studies which have been done by the Asia Development Bank and which have been done by the Footprint Network, which has been actually quoted by the Confederation of Indian Industry, which is unlikely to, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, quote this sort of a source, but they do because they realize that they have to take care of the resource base if they have a long-term growth strategy in mind. So the CII reported this in 2009, I think, uh, and as per that uh, Footprint Network report, uh, India is living far in excess of its biocapacity. That's the term they use. We've given some numbers uh, to this effect in the book. Um, there's also a study that's been done by the Cambridge economist Partha Dasgupta. And what he looks at is essentially what is, I mean, his definition of sustainability is a country which is actually growing its overall capital rather than diminishing it. What does he mean by overall capital? Three things. Man-made capital, which is to say plants, equipment, industry, and so on. Uh, human capital, education, and its you know, positive effects, and thirdly, natural capital. And he does a summation of these three. And what he finds is since the mid-70s or so, India's growth has actually been unsustainable or perhaps barely sustainable. And again, he does not cover the full range of indices which you need to consider. For instance, ignores climate change and its consequences and so on. So I'm just citing you three or four major studies which are all showing roughly the same thing. Uh, if you followed some of the news uh, this year uh, in June, uh, the Western Himalayas, Uttarakhand, which is the state to the west of Nepal, had some of its worst floods in history. And it rained continuously for two days. It didn't rain too much more than what some of the extreme events of rainfall have been there in the last century. Uh, I think it was about 60 centimeters or so in about as many hours, which is not a whole lot for that part of the Himalayas. But the impact of that was far greater. And the first cut sort of diagnosis of the climate uh, scientists and the meteorologists is that actually most of the erosive force of the rivers came not so much from the rain, but from the bursting of the glacial lakes. So in one particular case, the lake above Kedarnath, you know, burst and, you know, uh, what they call glof, glacial lake outburst flood. Uh, that is exactly what happened. Now the fact is also that this is a part of India which has something like 500 small, medium and large uh, hydroelectric projects going on, and as, as many as 40 large hydroelectric projects. 
Uh, there are parts of the state, if you travel there, uh, the, for instance, the road from Uttar, uh, Uttarkashi to Gangotri, which is about 140 kilometers, has as many as five large hydroelectric projects on the Bhagirathi River. So the land of the whole state has been dynamited for building roads, for building dams. A lot of projects which are actually not run off the river projects are described in that way. Uh, and have caused considerable damage to the you know, sort of fragile ecology, seismically sensitive ecology of the Himalayas in that part. Uh, so what you've seen uh, also, the tourist, tourist industry has exploded in that part of India. You know, there's been like a tenfold increase in tourist traffic in the last 15 years. So, and all this is very much in line with the growth strategy of the central government. It's not doing something unusual. Uh, it's trying to answer the energy needs of not only the state, but the rest of India. It's trying to cater to the tourist traffic from the rest of India and so on. So it's, it's a state very much uh, on the same page as the governments in New Delhi. So that's one example I could give you at least a dozen more examples of sort of extreme events which have happened in the last 10 years, uh, which actually point in the direction of much more disturbing realities than even the data and the reports which I've quoted you seem to show. So you, you and, and the other side of the picture is that when you look at the monitoring capacity of the state, uh, when it comes to environmental damage, it's so abysmal as to be virtually non-existent at this point. And just one statistic, there's something like 6,000 development projects all across India. The total capacity to actually, the, the, the institutional bureaucratic capacity to monitor these projects is about four offices with about five to six employees in each. So you're talking of about 25 inspectors looking at 6,000 projects. So, and a lot of the time governments have given arguments to the effect that responsible investors will, you know the rest. You know. So uh, you, you, know, you have a situation which is actually pretty self-explanatory in terms of where the data is coming from. We summarize all this in the book which we've uh, published as in terms of a metaphor which we call the burning train. So what happens on the burning train is this. If you've been to India and if you remember the trains there, so you have this locomotive in the front and then you have three or four air-conditioned coaches in the front, uh, AC 1, 2, 3, etc. And then you have many, many wagons, uh, which are actually uh, sleeper class, uh, non-air conditioned, where the multitudes travel, right? So we say that, you know, if you think of the speed of the train as economic growth, and you think of the people who are deciding the speed of the train as the people sitting in the air conditioned coaches, along with some station masters at platforms, think of the international financial institutions in that role, uh, and the train has caught fire from the back. So the flames are leaping from the back and the coaches have begun to derail at the back. So think of quarter million farmers having killed themselves since 1997, since India signed the agreement under, uh, on agriculture under WTO. Uh, you think of the coaches derailing from the back and the belief in the AC coaches is that the faster the train is driven, the faster the flames would die out. That's supposed to be trickled down, right? And in fact, the flames rise taller and there is nothing that is happening within the green bubbles, that is to say within the AC coaches, which would prompt decision makers and, and, and leaders and so on, cheerleading economists, to actually think of uh, making the right decisions. There's no incentive to do that. So if one set of people are paying the costs of development, another set of people are deriving the benefits, and if the decision makers sit among those who derive the benefits, there's not only no systematic tendency for good decisions to be taken, there's actually a systematic tendency for ecologically irrational decisions to be taken over time. The market economy will send you exactly the wrong signals, right? And when your regulatory capacity is in the shape it is in, you can expect crisis upon environmental crisis. So hence, my conclusion is that 
development right now in India is as impossible as it is inevitable because the people who are deciding are seeing no other choice and uh, at the same time the reality on the ground is both from an ecological and a socio-economic perspective that it's not going to happen. The famed development transition which brought prosperity to the Western world and Japan uh, and to some, de some degree China, uh, that's not going to take place in India with the same model. Uh, so the joke in India is that, you know, we are good at, if you want to test a theory, you bring it to India. So we destroyed socialism pretty thoroughly by the 1980s and we might end up destroying capitalism too. So I'll stop there. The Economist keeps writing that India wasted its surplus opportunity. What do they mean? What should they have done during the period of growth? I think what they mean is that uh, they did not invest adequately in areas which would have yielded rewards by now, uh, for instance, in infrastructure and so on. What they fail to tell you, or they might tell you in the margins or in the fine print, is something from which India is quite explicitly suffering now, which is this. The last time that India had a trade surplus was in 1977. That is roughly the same time that China had its last trade deficit, right? So you've had more than a generation when imports are rising like that and exports are rising like this, so the gap is widening from year to one year to the next, you have to finance this deficit, right? How do you do it? Well, you try to get investment from abroad. So long as you have to do that, you're going to be writing policies to entice financial and other investors from abroad. So the entire policy framework of the country, since at least the Rajiv Gandhi years, has been written with this in mind, is constantly being updated with this in mind, and is constantly being written in a state of unacknowledged panic. What happens if the money doesn't come? Well, what happens is the economy screeches to a halt in a few months or a few weeks because critical imports like oil and capital goods and computers can't be imported. Uh, so that's the extent of dependency that this growth strategy has led us to. Now, the, uh, the two things for which you're constantly dependent on the outside world from the Indian perspective today is, number one, demand for exports, which is not entirely in your hands. It depends on what the rest of the world is doing, whether they want your goods, what other competitors are doing, etc. And the second thing is capital. Again, something not in your hands. It depends on what the Fed's monetary policy is, how much money is there to be, how much liquidity is available for investment, and so on. So how does a country of India's size and scale develop such acute sensitivity to what the Federal Reserve decides in its meetings in the US? Well, this is how, because you've integrated financially, and for the rest, you're actually living on very, very different terms. Now, India is not the only economy to suffer from the, the Fed's policy reversals in the last few months. There are other emerging markets like Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, Indonesia, which have suffered the same problems. But India's concrete situation is a lot worse than that. There's something which uh, people in the area call reserve cover. So reserve cover is basically uh, the, the ratio of your foreign currency obligations in the next one year to the amount of foreign exchange reserves available with your reserve bank. And the numerator includes two things primarily. One is the, the, the trade gap, the deficit that has to be financed, and your short-term debt obligations, right? That reserve cover was about 300% till not so long ago, about two to three years ago. At this point, it's fallen to about 100%. Okay. And the total obligations for the next year are in the region of about 250 billion. And the reserves are about 270 billion. You know. 
to give you a contrast, China's reserve cover is about 800 you percent. Know? Not only that, their reserves are actually their own money, unlike India, where it's borrowed money. Cars temporarily parked in the Indian parking lot, so to speak. Right? So, uh, you know, this is the problem. And a lot of the Indian companies which have actually expanded in the last five years since the crisis, uh, they took on a lot of foreign currency debt and they're actually conducting operations within India. In other words, their revenue stream is in rupees. So if the rupee is deflating, you know, you will have a payments crisis. Uh, but these are not things which our corporates normally think about in the good times, you know. They sort of assume that the good times will last forever. So the, the, the strategy is very fragile and hence the, my sense is that next Fed meeting when it again goes back to its stance as it was in May, you will again get a rupee crisis. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you for a very uh, entertaining and wonderful talk and illuminating really um, in addition. Um, I was just wondering, you talked a lot about the state policy and the public sector and I was just wondering about you know, much is made lately in the last 10 years about the NGO sector in India. We have graduates, many dissertations on NGO working on the very two sectors that you identified as problematic, namely the ecological sector as well as the, uh, the social sector, you know, NGO working on women's health, on daily education, or on some sort of like environmental issues. Does your study take into, co into consideration this kind of input? Does this kind of work or let's say activity, does it make a dent? Does it help to raise consciousness? Does it impact the numbers or enlighten us a little bit about the NGO sector and, and its effect or non-effect, let's say, on the issue that you're raising here? Hmm. Well, I'm glad you raised the question because uh, there are many things to say about it. I'll just say a few things. Uh, first of all, the term NGO. It's, it's a sort of almost a residual description. Uh, there are a very large variety of groups, communities, organizations, movements, which get classified as NGOs. So I think one needs to move beyond the nomenclature if you want to identify where a genuine contribution is being made and where perhaps in some cases things are being stalled or delayed or postponed because of a false solution being put forward by somebody and so on. The second thing is that when you uh, start taking account of the impact, the impact at a micro level is significant, is significant. And in the second part of our book, we actually look at many such stories, dozens of such stories of work which is being done at the micro level by, uh, let's say, a women's group or a, you know, a microfinance group, although microfinance is a complicated area which has all sorts of problems. Uh, there is a panchayat in, in Tamil Nadu which is doing some extraordinary work. Some of it could be pioneering. The problem is, with all the examples which we've chosen, they can all be drowned out by the wider environment in which they find themselves caught today. So, you know, you're under a siege if you're doing good work I mean, for instance, this village outside Chennai, which I visited last year, uh, it's actually gotten rid of poverty. There is no poverty in that village. People are eating three meals a day. It's a caste integrated village, a 60% Dalit village where you have common water sources, you have common schooling, uh, common uh, health clinics and so on. Uh, almost 5,000 people live there. Nobody migrates from there, that sort of village. But it is surrounded by the expansion of Chennai. And so, uh, you know, every year, the, the uh, Sarpanch was telling me, every year there are battles with development authorities, with, he has to go to the courts, he has to mobilize people to just defend whatever few gains they have made. So I'm cutting a long story short, but basically my sense is that somebody is digging the hole much faster than it can be filled with a few efforts, noble as they are, in the exceptions. Yes. So you painted a very grim picture. Um, and some of the macroeconomists actually criticized India, the IMF, 
for a lot of its populist programs. And for a lot of its populist programs? Populist programs. So midday meal schemes, Narega, you know, subsidized employment schemes. And I understood the government was launching a proposal for a pension scheme for uh, informal sector yep. workers that was rolling out just in time for elections. Um, do they do any good? I mean, where do they fit in this picture? Well, like I was saying with respect to the Employment Guarantee Scheme, it has done some good in some parts of the country, but there are also problems. I mean, the new problems have arisen from it. I mean, for instance, and here I might sound like a right-wing neoliberal, uh, there are places where the incentive to work in the countryside has actually vanished because the standard of living was in general so poor uh, that 100 or 120 or 150 rupees a day actually means the earth to the people who get those wages. So if it was designed better, which is to say if you actually got serious work done in return for payment, in other words, in no case should it be a dole, then I think you would preserve the incentive to work. And in those states where that has been achieved in some districts, you've got success. In other places, no. Uh, Likewise with the food security bill which was you know, passed recently. Now, of course, there's no more populist measure than that in the election year and at a time when vegetable prices are sky high. I mean, you know, onions selling for 70 or 80 rupees a kilo, no political party has ever won an election in a year that the onion price has been rising like that. Uh, so, but again, its impact on the ground is going to be complicated. Uh, not only are your delivery systems not terribly different, uh, your, uh, you know, the, 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 the experience I was telling you with the employment guarantee scheme applies to the food security scheme as well. So, and one of my sort of nightmare scenarios for India is uh, a world in which you actually manage to tease out most of the rural population away from agriculture. Everybody is you know, posing this question of aspirations and how aspirations have to be answered in some way. Suppose you succeed in actually moving, you know, of the 60% of India employed in agriculture, you're able to, let's say, by some chance, uh, attract to the cities three quarters of that population. A generation from now, say 2035, you have a situation where most people are not living in the countryside. Most people in this generation will not have the skills of doing agriculture manually. And at the same time, you have a jobs crisis in the non-agricultural sector. But let's abstract from that. Suppose you solve that. You still have a situation where you have a fossil fuel driven mechanized agriculture, right? Diesel fed agriculture, living with less and less climate space every year, right? And you don't have a generation which knows how to do farming. And how are you going to feed 1.5 billion people? So you get to a sort of reductio ad absurdum, if you will, uh, with that sort of uh, strategy. Now, I, so what I want to say in, in a nutshell in answer to your question is that, you know, again, in a micro sense, in some cases, these policies, of course, do some good. Okay. But it's nowhere near the scale of the damage being done by the mainstream economy through its normal growth process. And there's nothing in the setup right now to actually remedy that on the scale that's required. Yeah, Zia. So in your um, last remark, you said that um, you know, people bring theories to India and that socialism came and failed and capitalism made them and failed. From what you just said, has democracy come and is it about to fail? Well, no. I mean, my view of Indian democracy is that it's a homegrown animal. It's not an imported zebra, you know. So it's going to survive and it's going to last, which is why my, my hopes are always linked with it. And in the book, we sort of conceive of a possible future for India if there is one as an ecological democracy. So if there was time, I would go into some detail as to what I mean by that. But I think that, you know, if, if you look at the three-tiered system of government that we have, then the bottom tier, the panchayat uh, level and the district level, that actually predates the British, you know. So democracy was not imported into India. I mean, I think the Westminster model was imported for New Delhi, uh, 
but the way people are used to taking decisions at the grassroots is not by any chance you know, uh, connected with that. So I think that therefore my, my sort of default sort of setting as far as India's future is concerned is to think of it as, as, as an ecological democracy. But in order to get there, it will first have to abandon the fantasy of becoming a superpower. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. And, and we've dived in, in the last uh, few minutes a lot of things that I was thinking about, but let me bring two points out. Uh, we had a very interesting conversation last week on the, uh, the schedule pass. Can you please, please, please get, get out of the Sorry, Let me keep it busy. Yes. So the question is, the, uh, how do you see, the, you, you mentioned uh, the 11 million jobs in the, in the organized private sector. How do you see the, uh, the unscheduled tasks into the 11 million picture? And how do you see Modi taking the whole thing forward in from, the, from your perspective? No, wait, I'm not following okay. something. Well, let's say the first one. The, 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 the benefits, and you mentioned the Gen I thing, have the benefits of these 11 million jobs getting created in the organized, unorganized mm -hmm. sector, all of these economic development, is that tricking down to the unscheduled tasks or the scheduled tasks? No. No. So what's the future? I mean, how does it all work out? Well, the future is uh, Fisipera's politics, uh, region, more and more regional politics, uh, Indian varieties of interesting fascisms, uh, Indian varieties of chauvinism, uh, the sort of thing you saw with Raj Thakre in Bombay some time back vis-a-vis -vis Biharis. Uh, so, uh, that is the default future, shall we say, but it's going to be contested. It's going to be contested the whole way. And I think that uh, something might come of it. I mean, I think before you get to what we call in the book a radical ecological democracy, you need a regional ecological democracy. And I think that, you know, the birth of green parties as and when it happens in India uh, is the way forward politically. But so far, it's not in the discussion, despite the fact that we've had four decades of environmental politics since Chipko, you know. Well, that open